There was a sticker that said, too many Christians, not enough lions. But I bought the sticker and I put it on my wall. When I tried to purge my new age paraphernalia, it was in every nook and cranny of my house. Certain pieces of jewelry I'd throw away multiple times because it just kept coming back. What do you mean it would keep coming back? And I turned and I had a few people already turned toward me and they said, peace be with you. And I just realized in that moment, I had looked down on them. My soul was bared open and Jesus and I were just looking at it. And I felt really ashamed, but then I also felt such love. I knew I was home. Nora Jensen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for coming in. So I saw your story and I was fascinated by it and then very inspired to see your outspokenness about form, being formerly Wiccan mm -hmm. and now becoming Catholic. That's quite a big jump and big difference. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to share, have you share your story with the podcast. I know folks listening, many of them are on their own faith journeys, or at least they're very interested in the topic of faith. And certainly with your experience with Wicca, I think that also resonates with a lot of people who are looking at new age and its popularity today. Mm -hmm. So thank you for making the time to do this. Of course. All right. So let's start with your background. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing and uh, your, your childhood. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I grew up in Colorado in the beautiful mountains, mm -hmm. and um, the most important thing was our tight-knit family. We didn't grow up with any religion. Um, if my parents talked about God, I don't really remember much about it. Mm -hmm. I believed in God, but believed that He just made us and moved on, um, if anything. Mm -hmm. And there was more of an anti-Christian viewpoint in my family, I guess, uh, just kind of what they believe isn't true and mm -hmm. silly and things like that. And so I, I don't, I think they must've had that already. And then it kind of got passed on to my brother and I. So how did you first get exposed to Wicca? Well, my brother and I were playing in our yard. Our yard was a half acre, a field, and we were running around and we stumbled upon a large stone circle. And we immediately thought Satanists must be out on our yard coming at night and doing weird things. And so we thought we need to just destroy this circle. So we kicked the stones and threw them as far as we could. And then we went inside to tell my mom this amazing thing that we did. And I remember her, even at that age, I was probably around 11, her reaction was odd to me because she didn't really react. Mm. She didn't seem surprised that there was a circle. She didn't seem upset or happy that we destroyed it. Um, so, but I didn't know what to make of it. So I just went about the day and then later on, my dad called my brother and I into the bedroom and uh, sat down with us and my mom. And he just said, what if I were to tell you that magic was real? And we just looked at each other and rolled our eyes and thought, dad's pulling another prank again. Mm -hmm. He was a big trickster. And, uh, and he said, it's real. And witches and wizards are real. And your mom and I are Wiccans, which are modern day witches and wizards. And the more he talked about it, he just had this magnetic sparkle in his eye and I was totally drawn in. And I thought, okay, I want to be Wiccan too by the end of the conversation. And my brother just didn't seem to care as much. So just to backtrack for a moment, that stone circle that you found at 11 years old with your brother, mm -hmm. that you guys thought this must be Satanist. Mm -hmm. You had this idea already that Satanism was a thing, that there was mm -hmm. such a thing as Satan and they would maybe do rock circles. Where did you get that original idea? I'm thinking probably from media. Okay. Because my parents, if they wanted to watch a movie, there was no restrictions. We could come and join them and watch it too. It didn't matter what movie it was. And there were some movies that um, had th those kinds of imagery in it, I think. Um, like I think one of them was Wishmaster or something. So the idea was had been presented before, not as even something positive, obviously, because we saw it as a negative, but that's the only place I can think of. So when your dad tells you with your mother and your brother and you're 11 years old that effectively he is a wizard, he's saying he's a wizard and mm -hmm. your mother is a witch, mm -hmm. what was your reaction to that? Well, I thought it was crazy at first, um, but then the more he kept talking, and I can't quite remember how he was explaining it, but he was talking about how the magic that they do is different than what is shown in um, TV or movies or things like that. And so that's what intrigued me was, okay, so this is different. What is it? And he had said that it was him and my mom had built the circle and were, that they used it for um, magic. And so then I wanted to learn what it was he was talking about. Do you know how your parents got involved in Wicca? Um. I, one of my parents had a very rough childhood and when 
all of that came rushing back at one point. One of the things that the new age promises, it's an empty promise, but it's its control, that you have control over your life, your um, reality, you can create your own reality. So I suspect that it, it was maybe a way to come to terms with the negative things that had happened in that in my parents' life and a way for them to, after the fact, feel like they had control over it. What does it mean to be a Wiccan witch or wizard? <laughs> Modern day Wicca is, it was invented in the 50s mm -hmm. by a man named Gerald Gardner. And so it's it's interesting because there are no, the beliefs of Wicca, when, when I was Wiccan, I thought that I was practicing um, ancient pre-Christian practices that had been secretly passed down. Mm -hmm. But there's just no evidence for that. Um, and so Gerald Gardner was a man from Britain, and he claimed to have found this coven who had these ancient secrets mm -hmm. And that they told them to him, and then he wrote them in books. So, really, it's it's very nature worship, um, goddess worship for Wicca. Um, a lot of look trying to harness energy and um, doing spells and things like that of that nature. Um, so to be, but to be, and one Wiccan can look totally different from another because there is no one coherent set of beliefs for Wicca. There's just different, almost like uh, sects or things like that. So is there a governing document of any kind or a charter of some kind for Wicca? Or is it more kind of a set of loose, loosely held, you know, operational beliefs and sort of uh, maybe attitudes or specific actions that people can take? The latter, for sure. Okay. I mean, you can believe in whatever gods you want, whatever goddesses you want. I really was interested in the Egyptian ones, but another person who could claim to be Wiccan could say, I don't believe in those at all. So does the Wiccan person think that they are dealing with anything demonic or satanic? No, that's what's interesting about Wicca is we we would say that we don't believe in the devil because we believe that to give evil a name is to give it power, mm. which doesn't really make sense, but it doesn't exist and it doesn't matter, right? Mm. If you give something a name, it just doesn't exist. But um, that was the main thing was that in Wicca, we are not devil worshipers. We don't do anything evil. Um, that's all what you see in movies. What were kind of activities that your parents did? You mentioned the stone circle, mm -hmm. but did did you learn, you know, after this revelation about your parents being, as they called themselves, a wizard and a witch, did you learn what they did, what that actually entailed for them? That's interesting too, because we did not really even practice as a family. Mm -hmm. um, so because I was interested in it, my parents bought me a book um, and it was a book that was geared toward teenagers. It talked about what Wicca was and had a lot of spells in it that were geared toward teenage angst um, things. And so really, I just became a, what they call a solitary practitioner, which is what a lot of Wiccans are. It's not really as much of a group necessarily. So did you ever do any of the spells or any of mm -hmm. the Wicca, Wicca practices with your parents? Sometimes, um, occasionally. The things that I remember, like there was one instance where my mom came to me with an exercise where um, we were supposed to look at a, a specific image and I'm, I'm vague because I, I don't want anyone who might have a curiosity in the mm. occult to be piqued. And then by mm. what I say, go look at it. So it was a very specific image. And we were to do an exercise where we could um, use the image to then close our eyes mm. and go through. It was like a door. And she had told me that when you go through this door, you, there's supposed to be a different plane of existence on the other side. Mm. And... Um, that you could explore, you could create whatever you wanted, mm -hmm. um, created your own reality again. But when you, when we were done, always to come back through the door before I opened my eyes, because otherwise a part of you could get left behind. Mm. And that's another point is there's always a warning when it comes to the practices of Wicca and the occult. And so we sat down together to do this exercise and, and it was like 30 minutes with nothing happening. And then finally I closed my eyes and I went through the door and I found myself in this very strange place. It was a, a void, really. Um, and all around me was like a billowing fog and it was red and black, but I could, I couldn't really see through it, but I could move through it. So I started walking through it and all of a sudden everything solidified around me. They became like boulders and I couldn't go anywhere. And it was very scary. And so I tried to go back to get back through the door, like she said, but I literally just couldn't move at all. And I, I just, my eyes flung open and she was standing over me in a panic. And she said um, that I'd been flailing in the chair and I was breathing heavily. 
And I told her what happened, and she went back onto the computer to read and said that some people had experienced what I said, but they continued to walk through it, and then they got to the other plane of existence. And I just said it. I couldn't. It was like rocks. I couldn't go anywhere. And then she asked, do you want to continue doing this? And I said, no, absolutely not. So, And then one time I did the Ouija board with my dad, and my brother and my mom were in attendance as well. And that was, we didn't get very far um, because it was just a very unsettling experience, and, and then we never did it again. Tell me more about your experience that scared you with the Ouija board. Sure. So with the Ouija board, it's a communication board um, to communicate with uh, any anything on the other side. And um, there's a, a tool that you have your hands on, and it's supposed to move around the board um, when something is communicating with you and it spells out messages and things like that. And so um, my dad had his fingers on it and I had my fingers on it. And we just started asking if there was anything that wanted to communicate with us, anything that was present, anyone that was present and doing this for a few minutes. And then all of a sudden the, the tool, um, it's called a planchette, it jumped under our fingers. And I, I mean, my dad was such a big trickster that I thought, don't do that. Did you do that? And he, he swore that he did not do that. And so um, we kept going, kept asking, and then it lurched again. And, um, and he was freaked out too. So at that point, um, I just took my hands off and I said, I don't want to do this anymore. This is kind of scary. And he agreed. So we didn't go any further with it. We Heart Nutrition provides wholesome supplements and vitamins, and they have wholesome values. Not only does We Heart Nutrition use the highest quality, research-backed ingredients that are always in the most bioavailable form, We Heart Nutrition is also unapologetically pro-life. In fact, 10% of every sale of their vitamins is given back to pregnancy care centers. You may not know this, but many of the major multivitamin companies are owned by corporations that donate directly to Planned Parenthood. With We Heart Nutrition, it's the opposite. It's not only a best-in-class vitamin, but they're donating 10% of their proceeds back to pro-life resource centers. We Heart Nutrition sells vitamins for women at every age and stage of life, including options for preconception, pregnancy, postpartum, and postmenopause. So go to weheartnutrition.com today. Use the code Lila for 20% at checkout. Now, when you place an order of $50 or more at weheartnutrition.com, you will receive a free signature bamboo capsule box. These boxes are adorable and make taking your vitamins or traveling with them easy. Check out weheartnutrition.com and use the code Lila at checkout for 20% off. That's weheartnutrition.com. We've had a lot of exorcists on the show and they have specifically said that Ouija board is can be particularly an opening to mm -hmm. the demonic because when you just invite any old spirit in like that, you know, mm -hmm. if it's not an angel, which is serving God, it's a devil, which is serving, mm -hmm. you know, a demon, which is serving the devil. Do you think that your dad, I mean, afterwards, was there any conversation about, you know, maybe this part of Wicca is a little scary or did you talk about it at all after that? I don't remember. I mean, I think we, we would agree that there were parts of Wicca that seemed a little off, but then we, we just kind of stayed away from mm -hmm. that part. So I feel like we just really snorkeled on the surface mm -hmm. of Wicca. We did not go too deep because anytime we tried, it was scary experiences. Mm -hmm. We have had exorcists on the show who have said that the number, there are two top ways that people experience demonic oppression or possession. Mm -hmm. And these are very serious things, obviously, that not everyone experiences, not everyone who dabbles in the occult will experience directly possession or oppression, mm -hmm. but certainly it can open the door to it, which is very scary. And it should be mm -hmm. scary because it, you know, to pretend like it doesn't exist, I think is is a hugely wrong move for people to make. But what they say is, what they've said is that there are two main categories. One of them is new age practices. Mm -hmm. That can be crystals or the Ouija board. That can be, you know, tarot cards, going to see a, uh, you know, a soothsayer or, a, you know, a, a fortune teller, or it is sexual sins, basically mm -hmm. perversion, pornography, prostitution, like anything in that abuse, um, anything in that world can also open the door. It doesn't always, but can open the door to the demonic. So we don't want to give Satan too much credit mm -hmm. <laughs> in terms of everything bad that may happen to someone is Satan or everything bad that someone may do or mistake that someone may make that suddenly there's sat satanic activity involved. That being said, I think it's very important for people to know the dangers of, of this. So let's go next to, you know, you're, you're, you're doing, you call yourself a solo practitioner. Mm hmm how did you then go from being a solo practitioner in Wicca to now you're Catholic? Well, so I practiced Wicca all through high school, through middle school and high school. 
and then I went to college. Mm -hmm. And when I got to college, everything was just new. It was different. I made new friends and my faith just took a back seat. Plus the Wicca that I practiced was so grounded in the teenage um, stuff that I learned about dealing with teenage stuff. But here I am now I'm getting close to 20 and I'm not really a teenager anymore. And I didn't have the same issues or experiences that I did when I was 11, 12, 14, 15. And so um, when after a couple years of college, I just started feeling a hole or something was missing in my life. And um, I had always thought it's best to just learn from other people's mm -hmm. bad experiences than do my own if I can. And so I knew that sometimes when people are missing something, they might go party or try drugs or um, sex or mm -hmm. things like that. And I didn't want to do those things. And so I felt pretty... Why, why by the way? Because it sounds like I mean, your average person, a lot of them will dabble in maybe not drugs, but they'll dabble maybe in party life or... Mm -hmm maybe even hookup culture or something in their early college years. You know, that's mm -hmm. kind of our culture today. Yeah. What was it that was the wall for you that you didn't want to try those things? I think it was the way my parents raised me, mm -hmm. really. I mean, they, even though they, they were in the new age, they were really good parents. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't want to um, do anything that would disappoint them ever. And I also just watching other people who had done those same things and how that turned out for them, it didn't seem like a positive thing. I didn't. I, I want to just, like I said, learn from their experiences rather than make mistakes of my own if I could avoid it. And so, um, yeah, so I, I felt like, well, then this maybe this is God then that I'm missing. Mm -hmm. And so I had taken some uh, classes in college on Eastern philosophy and religions, and I it sounded a lot like New Age to me. And so I just thought, I just don't think that that's where God is. Um, definitely new Christianity. He's not there. Whoever Jesus is has nothing to do with God. Why? So, why did? Why? Why? Why not New Age and why not Christianity? It sounds like you immediately discounted both I of did. them. I did. I did. Um, so one of the things in when at least when I was growing up in the '90s and practicing Wicca, there was an anti-Christian um, bias underneath that practice. The books that I read had it in it. Um, the places I visited had had it in there, and so I just had an anti-Christian mindset already. So I, I didn't, I was not interested. Were there any other experiences that you had had with Christianity or beliefs you had about Christianity in your teen or early college years that made you have a, a sense of distance from Christianity? Sure. Um, there was one, I had a friend who her father was Catholic, but I don't think he was practicing, but um, because she never talked about going to mass or anything like that. And she, we were hanging out more and more and she started to become interested in Wicca. Uh, when her father found out, he got really upset and he forbade us from hanging out anymore. And our friendship ended pretty much when that happened. And I just remembered being pretty upset and thinking, um, you know, I'm a nice person. And he, I've gone over to her house. We've done sleepovers. She's been at mine. Like, I don't understand what the problem is. And so I just thought she had told me, well, he's Catholic and he was raised Catholic. And so to me, it's like, oh, well, then Catholics are very mean and they're very judgmental. How old were you? That was in high school. That would have been probably 16. I'm sorry you had that experience. <laughs> Do you think it was because did she, did she, there was there any explanation? Were they afraid of like the demonic? Was that part of it or? I didn't get an explanation. Okay. Yeah. And so you were also saying though, that as a college student, you were kind of discounting Christianity, like it's foolish. It doesn't make sense. But you also felt that way about new age. I Philosophy. started to, yeah, because it was tiresome. Mm -hmm. um, and I had practiced it for, I mean, what, maybe eight years or so. And I never wanted to delve too deep into it because of the experience I had with my mom and the Ouija board. But also I had looked through some of their books. Some were written by Gerald Gardner, who I'd mentioned earlier, but they were like the more adult books on Wicca and they were really dry. And um, they were just, it did not resonate with me. And so I knew that that wasn't the answer to go buy those books I had already looked at um, as a teenager. So when you were on this journey now to kind of discover a faith or a belief system, as a college student, you discount Wicca, you discount Christianity. Mm -hmm. Where did you land? <laughs> what happened next? <laughs> Back into Wicca. Okay. So I, it was all I knew. So I thought if God isn't in Christianity, if he's not in Eastern, I don't know anything else. Um, so I'm just going to, I guess I'll just go back to Wicca. And so 
I pulled out my teen witch book and dusted it off. And I, I started reading from the beginning and it was, it started off with a creation story and I'm reading this creation story and I'm thinking, this doesn't make sense either. Who, who made this up? I feel like somebody made this mm. up. And how do we know that this is how it, things were created? And so I kind of flipped through the spells. And like I said, it was teenage angst spells. And so I thought, well, I don't have these issues anymore. I'm 21 at this point. And so I thought maybe what I need to do is I'll just put the books away. I will contemplate who I think God is. And I'll do the spells I know and just tr maybe I'll find him that way. That's a, So that's what I did. And I had decided that whatever it was, I needed to be 100% in because it's God. It's got to be the most important thing in my life. So I was going to live like it was. So what happened next? Well, then um, I met my husband now, Dane. Um, I met him at work and we ended up going out on a date and we started talking about faith and he asked me, I think I asked him first, um, what are you? And, and he said, oh, I'm Catholic. I'm Roman Catholic. And inside I'm just going, oh, gross. Like, why do I have to find the one Roman Catholic in Colorado Springs? And, um, but then he asked me what I was and I said, well, I'm, I'm wicked. You know, I made sure I sat up tall and was really bold and, and confident about it. And he just, he didn't run away. He didn't make a face. He just kind of asked me a little bit about about it. And that was it. And, and I thought, okay, well, here's a Catholic, no less, because I didn't know anything about Catholics, but I'd heard enough that they were probably pretty bad. <laughs> um, and I said, well, here's a Catholic who's, who's being really nice and is accepting me. So maybe that softened my heart a little bit, I think. Seven Weeks Coffee is America's pro-life coffee company on a mission to fund the pro-life movement, one cup of delicious coffee at a time. Why are they called Seven Weeks Coffee? Because at seven weeks, the baby is the size of a coffee bean, and it's the same time that the heartbeat can be first clearly detected on ultrasound. That's why Seven Weeks Coffee donates 10% of every sale to support pregnancy resource centers across the country. Seven Weeks Coffee has raised over half of a million dollars, $500,000 for these centers, and has helped save 5,000 lives by providing free ultrasounds and other resources to moms in need. Now, let me tell you about the delicious coffee. Seven Weeks Coffee is harvested from the top 1% to 2% of beans in the world. Their beans are mold-free, pesticide-free, shade-grown, and low-acid, and they're organically farmed. Seven Weeks Coffee truly checks all the boxes. And just in time for the holiday season, Seven Weeks Coffee is having their biggest promotion yet. You can enjoy exclusive discounts, free gifts with every order, and new limited edition coffees. And exclusively for my listeners, you can go to sevenweekscoffee.com and use the code LILA for up to 25% off your order. That's sevenweekscoffee.com and use the code LILA for up to 25% off your first order. Then um, we continued dating, and at one point it was a few weeks into our relationship, we started talking about faith again. But this time, instead of telling him what Wicca was, I started talking about what I thought God was with all of the things I'd been contemplating. And every single thing I said, he would say, well, that's what the Catholic Church teaches. That's what the Catholic Church believes. And after like five or six times, I'm going, really? This is insane. I should probably check out this Catholic Church. And so I went home and I pulled up a Wikipedia page and I think I got, in maybe not to the first paragraph. I don't, I didn't get past the first mm -hmm. paragraph because it was like a different language. I had no idea what a Trinity was, um, something about Jesus. It was just so bizarre to me that I closed the page and said, I don't know, this doesn't make sense to me right now. And then I guess as time mm -hmm. fast forward, we, he wanted me to come out to Arizona and meet his family. And so, uh, I was very nervous. Um, I knew they were Catholic. Mm -hmm. His dad had just come into the Catholic church. So this was a big deal. And his um, dad had just come into the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So there was a conversion in his family around this time? Yes. Had he been, uh, was it a reversion? He had been Catholic before not no. practicing or he had been a different religion? I think he was atheist. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, his whole life, I believe. And so he um, then started looking into Catholicism. And so when I met Dane, he was going through RCIA. Mm. And then his mom was a revert. She grew up Catholic, left for a little bit and then came back. And so um, they knew I was, I knew that they knew that I was Wiccan. And so I was just really nervous. But when we got out to Arizona, we didn't talk about faith. I met his mom. I had met his dad previously in Colorado Springs. Um, but 
there was just a, a peace and a joy in their family that I had never experienced before. And I knew it was from their faith. It was very obvious, but they, they just accepted me. They were very loving, mm -hmm. didn't talk about faith at all, didn't um, try to corner me. It was just a very beautiful experience. And so that left me, I believe, with my heart softening a little bit more after that. So what, what happened next to help you come into the church and how did that happen coming into the Catholic church? Yeah. So his mom, she's such, she is my advocate. Um, she told him you, if Nora is interested in Catholicism, you should really bring her to the Catholic mass. Mm -hmm. And so he hadn't been going to mass either. So he did some research and he thought maybe the best mass to bring Nora is the cathedral in Colorado Springs. And so we go down to the cathedral. Well, he asked me first, do you want to go? And I said, yeah, I'd be interested in going. So we went to the cathedral, and I don't remember everything about that Mass, but what I remember is walking in, how happy everybody was, and the ushers, who I, I didn't know that's what they were at the time, but they were so welcoming. Mm -hmm. I felt like they were looking at me and just welcoming, not just, oh, here comes another person in the church, but me specifically. And we got in, and before we had gone there, Dane said, just kneel when I kneel and stand when I stand and do what I do. And when it comes time to take the Eucharist, cross your, your hands because you're not Catholic. And so... Um, but he did he was he going to receive the Eucharist? No. You know? oh, no, no. Oh, his his okay. mom is very... So he knew to cross you. Yes. Because he yeah. hadn't been practicing his, right. his faith. Interesting. Because yeah, okay. he hadn't been going. So, um, yeah. And so... But it was... I guess it's different for me in a way because mm -hmm. I... Well, no, I guess it's not different. But... Um, so neither of us received. But... The part that was my conversion was uh, at the sign of peace, because when when we were when we were told to give each other the sign of peace, I didn't know what that was, and I looked at Dane and I just looked at him and went, "What is this?" And he had this sheepish smile and he said, "Peace be with you," and he gave me a hug, and then I watched him turn to the people, and I'm probably gonna cry, around him. Uh, and so that's what I did too. And he was shaking their hands. So I was like, okay, I guess I turn and I shake hands with people. And I turned and I had a few people already turned toward me. And they said, peace be with you. And I just realized in that moment that um, I had mocked these people. I had looked down on them. I had seen them as foolish, like you said. Mm. And yet they wouldn't wish me peace. And I knew that they didn't know that. But I knew in that moment that Jesus did. And I felt like my soul was bared open and mm. sorry. <laughs> and Jesus and I were just looking at it. And it was just all of the rot that was there, the mocking. And I felt really ashamed. But then I also felt such love coming from him that I, f I knew I was home. And I knew at that moment, I want to be Catholic. I found God. This is what's going to fill that hole. So. Did you tell, did you tell your, no. your boyfriend when you walked oh, no. out soon to be husband? Mm -mm. Cause I, I didn't know how to even word it. I didn't know what happened. It was such a jarring um, experience that I just wanted to sit with it for a while. Um, but we were, I was just pretty quiet on the drive home and, um, yeah, as, as time went on, I said, can go keep going to Mass? <laughs> and so we checked out a few different Masses, and his mom got me a Bible mm -hmm. and tried to go through RCIA. Um, at, well, this was an out after we got married, mm -hmm. so we got married in the Catholic Church because that's what Dane wanted, and I knew I would be Catholic someday, so I said, absolutely, let's do it. Um, and then tried to go through RCIA, but it was just a frustrating experience mm -hmm. because— um, they wanted, there's always a period called the inquiry period before where you ask questions and uh, get any things out of the way that might prevent you from becoming Catholic. And I just, everything was a big question that I felt like they didn't really know what to do with me. They wanted specific questions and I didn't have them. I just, I wanted to know everything. So um, it didn't work out at that time for me to go through RCIA. And it wasn't until I was pregnant with my son about four years later that I, and we had already moved to Arizona that I went through RCIA. How was the second RCIA experience oh, different from the first? It was amazing. Mm -hmm. And both my in-laws were there walking that journey with me. My mother-in-law sponsored me. And so it was just much, much better. Um, the very first day, I it was just me because nobody else could come. And me and the catechist, and we just got to talk. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really helpful because 
somehow it was just easier rather than being in a group setting to start a conversation and um, what what I had noticed about what I thought about God and things like that. I have so many questions about the process you experienced because it's very beautiful. So thank you for sharing it. And for everyone listening, and I'm going to pray for this grace for myself too, for the grace to see our own hearts the way Jesus does, mm -hmm. the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. Because if we are not, if we're kind of in deception about our own failings and we think we don't need Jesus, mm -hmm. right, then we will never get to receive him. There will be a block to him, mm -hmm. but to pray for the humility to see our need for him. Yeah. That's a great prayer. And you, 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 ha you were given that grace. I was given that. Yes. What was it like to complete RCA and then enter the Catholic church? It was amazing. Um, my son, I got to be baptized with him. He was six months. So that was really, really, really special. Um, but yeah, I had gotten to receive, I was the Easter vigil when I went in and I received my confirmation, my first Holy Eucharist and baptism all at the Easter vigil. And the most um, impactful sacrament, at least that I felt was baptism. Cause once, once I was baptized, I just felt so light, mm -hmm. like I was about to fly up to heaven. Um, and so, and then of course the Eucharist was, I know it was special, but at the time it didn't make as much of an mm -hmm. impact on me as it does now. Mm -hmm. What has it like been like for you now as a practicing Catholic, how many years has it been? Eight. How, been has, eight how has the last eight years been? And how has, how do you feel like God has been moving in your life over the last eight years? Well, um, I always now try to really reflect on the Eucharist and who I'm about to receive. And, um, and so there was a time where my father-in-law actually asked me about when my, with my first Holy Eucharist, did I feel anything? And I said, no. Mm -hmm. And, and he was kind of like, oh, huh, okay. Which I thought maybe there's something wrong with mm -hmm. me. And I remembered praying and saying, why didn't I feel anything? God, like help me feel something, I guess. And, um, I started crying every single time I received the Eucharist. Crying which was because you, I don't, I don't know. It was really frustrating because I would receive at mass and then I would just start bawling and everyone's looking at me and asking if I'm okay. My husband wants to know if I'm okay. And I'm like, I don't know why I'm crying. I just don't. And then I ended up stumbling on, um, St. Ignatius, uh, discernment of spirits podcast from father Timothy mm -hmm. Gallagher. And one of the things was that, um, movements of tears toward holy things is movement of the Holy spirit. Mm. And so then I thought, okay, God, I get it now. Can I stop crying at mass, please? I get it. Um, but one of the things that he, where I'm at now is, um, have you heard of catechesis of the good shepherd? Yeah. Yes. So I'm a level one catechist and kind of fell into that, but just learning more about our faith and the Eucharist and Jesus mm -hmm. and his institution of it has been really beautiful too, with understanding did you know that every year 200,000 families go bankrupt from medical bills, even with health insurance? For many people, insurance is simply not working for them. That's why I'm excited to share with you about Crowd Health, which is an alternative model for paying for your health care. Crowd Health takes your bills, personally negotiates them on your behalf, and then sends out a request to the community to help cover your bills. The Crowd Health community has fully funded more than 5,000 medical bills over the last two years. This includes accidents like a young woman in Tennessee who lost her fingers in a boating accident to NICU babies and cancer cases. Keep in mind, Crowd Health is not the same thing as insurance, but it is an alternative model to help pay medical bills and keep your monthly costs low. So go to Join Crowd Health today. Use the code Lila at checkout to get your first three months for only $99. That's joincrowdhealth.com and use the code Lila at checkout to get your first three months for only $99. Joincrowdhealth.com. Share happening. with us about the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. That's so wonderful that you're being trained in that. Yeah. So it's a Montessori based program, Catechesis program for children. Um, there's different levels uh, for different ages, but it's, it's not so much as opposed to like a book program for mm -hmm. catechesis where children would learn um, about the faith and maybe questions and answers and they spit the answer back out. Mm -hmm. uh, catechesis of the Good Shepherd really focuses on helping the child form a relationship with God and fall in love with God. Mm -hmm. And so um, the, it's, it's like 90 hours of training for each level or at least for level one, which I have. But the training itself mm -hmm. is so, it's catechizing for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, it just opens up the scriptures mm -hmm. so much more and opens up our faith so much mm -hmm. more. 
And so it, I'm happy that I get to help with the children learn too, but it's been such a gift for just my own formation. That's so wonderful that you learned how to do that. There's a program that we've planning to put our little ones in mm -hmm. that teaches that, but I was, I was, as I was learning about it, I was like, I wish I knew how to, you know, how to not just teach it, but to receive it because mm -hmm. it's so, it's basically encountering Jesus with that very childlike mm -hmm. spirit, which we're called to do as adults, mm -hmm. not just as, not just to help our children to do that, but we're called to have that same approach to Jesus as a child does. Mm -hmm. And watching the children, it, it's helpful to see then how children approach it because the whole point is, yes, I am the catechist, but the real teacher is the Holy Spirit. So my role is to just get out of the way in what we call the atrium is the room where the children are and to let the Holy Spirit speak to these little souls and just the things they say and come up with. It's mind boggling or mind blowing, I should say. Um, it's beautiful, beautiful, simple, but beautiful and very deep. Your story for people listening, I imagine that some of them, maybe they know someone who has been involved in the new age, or maybe they themselves have been involved in the new age. And maybe that someone's listening to your story and thinking, okay, it's beautiful. She's in love with Jesus now. You know, she's a Catholic. She's practicing her Catholic faith, but it sounds like her parents were pretty great. And it sounds like she had some scary experiences with it, but sometimes that happens in life. And it sounds like overall Wicca wasn't so bad, mm -hmm. you know, playing devil's advocate here, sure. <laughs> maybe quite literally. But anyways, um, what would you have to say to that? Because I think there's a lot of people who dabble in this spirituality stuff, not the, the true, I believe, spirituality of the church and of Jesus Christ, but they're going into it with sincerity mm -hmm. and they're themselves trying to be a good person. What would you say to them? It's one of the things that I tell one of my family members, because they, who, who are in the occult, it, nothing seems bad and they don't understand why it would be bad. And if you're protecting yourself with a protection spell, um, then why? What's the danger? And I just think about the lot of times we hear in the news, people knock on someone's door and they pretend to be with the energy company. Can I come in and look at the meter? Mm -hmm. They're not going to knock on the door and say, I'm here to rob you. Can you let me in? Why would the demonic be any different? They're going to try to trick you. They're going to try to make it seem helpful and beautiful. And you could do this spell and it would help you. It would help somebody. Um, what's bad about that? But Obviously, I mean, it is bad. It's in scripture that we shouldn't be doing this. You've had exorcists on here who talk about that. And so I would say to those people who who are doing that, if you're going to put your trust somewhere, why not just put trust in God? Because he's not going to lead you astray. It's the forbidden fruit all over again. The apple looked good for, or the fruit, I should say, looked good for eating, right? The tree looked good for producing good fruit. It didn't look that bad. But what happened when Adam and Eve ate the apple is they lost that grace in their souls. I It might seem like I came out relatively unscathed uh, compared to other people, and I would probably at this point agree. Um, I, As far as I know, I never experienced a possession or anything like that, but I drug other people down with me and have watched the certain things that happened in their lives. Whether or not those negative things were a result, I don't know, but um, gosh, if it were... And that's because of me. That's awful. And the other thing is, when I, when I first became Catholic, I didn't even think Wicca was bad. I still, I thought the church was wrong mm -hmm. on that. And it wasn't until I really started doing a deep dive into it, um, had some conversations with some loved ones, and realized what they were saying. That that's when I realized, okay, this is actually very, very bad. Um, when I tried to purge my my New Age paraphernalia. It was like a cockroach infestation. They were. It was in every nook and cranny of my house. Um, certain pieces of jewelry I'd throw away multiple times because it just kept coming back. What do you mean it would keep coming back? I would. There was a ring and a necklace that I threw away, and then I went a few months later. I went into my um, jewelry box to look for something, and there they were. And I thought, I know, I knew I threw these away, right? I'm sure I threw them away. I wouldn't have kept them. So I picked them out again, and I threw them away again. And a few months later, I was like. I'm going to check just to make sure, because I know I threw those away and there they were again. And so I think it was about three or four times I had to throw them away. Um, Why do you think that was happening? I don't know, but it was unsettling. And if I were a demon to play devil's advocate, I'd probably play those kind of games on people. To try to spook them and make them feel uncomfortable about the throwing away and uncomfortable about the new faith? Mm. I don't know, or just to bring, yeah, fear. Maybe mm -hmm. if there's another door open through that, I don't know. 
but it was just very strange. And other people I've talked to have had that experience Mm -hmm. as well. Um, There was a woman I knew with a Ouija board she had to throw away multiple times. And so um, especially somebody who's, who would say that they love Jesus, read it in scripture. We are not supposed to be doing these things. It's right there. Mm. There are some, we have a lot of uh, Protestant and evangelical brothers and sisters who listen to the show. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest, um, I think, concerns that they have about Catholicism. And we've addressed this on the show to some degree, but we're going to be doing more apologetics episodes in the future as well. So let me know if you have a take on this. But one of the concerns is in the Old Testament, there is prohibition on calling in the dead, you know, necromancy. So Mm -hmm. calling on the dead, you know, and this would be really fortune telling, asking, Mm -hmm. you know, what, where, you know, what's going to happen in my future. And then asking maybe a dead relative to give you a specific message or, or something like this. And so there is this confusion that will the Catholic tradition, which is really an ancient Christian tradition that spans 2000 years Mm -hmm. of asking for the intercession of those who have been faithful Mm -hmm. in this life, who've gone on to the next for asking for their prayers, praying for the dead, that this is somehow a violation of that teaching. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? It's a very big contrast with the new age um, method, at least. I mean, when with necromancy, you're trying to communicate with the dead. It's not just asking, um, can you please pray for me for this? And then you just leave it at that. It's trying to get an answer back. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there's a very, very big difference with that. How has your family received your change of no longer practicing Wicca and now being in the Catholic church? They can see the fruits, but they're, um, sad about it, uh, mm-hmm. especially when I became Catholic, when I was really discerning it. I had mm-hmm. one family member beg me not to become Catholic because they thought that my um, faith would be limited mm-hmm. because now I'm being told what to believe in by the Catholic Church, as opposed to it was me um, agreeing with what I was learning uh, in the Catholic Church. And so it's nice. I mean, we can talk about it and they they do see I'm a better uh, wife and a better daughter and mother and friend. But um, I think there's one family member that thinks of some point I'm going to renounce my Catholicism and come back, which is a little frustrating, but I can't control what other people think. Yeah. Well, we can pray, right? And I do. Yeah. (laughs) Pray pray and love. Mm -hmm. Nora, thank you so much for sharing your story. Any other advice that you have for people listening uh, when it comes to exploring the Catholic faith? Oh, gosh. Um, Well, I would say don't stop exploring. I mean, there's so many things. Uh, That's what I love about Catholicism is any question you have, Mm -hmm. there's answers for it. There's explanations for it. Um, And there's so many amazing people to learn from. So definitely keep exploring if they're interested. And um, I'll be praying that they come home. Thank you. Do you have any, one more question. Do you have any favorite saints? Um, Yes. Um, I mean, I love... The, the big ones like St. Mm-hmm. Teresa of Calcutta, um, St. Therese, mm-hmm. but there's one who I'm praying becomes a saint. Um, mm-hmm. I think he's a servant of God mm-hmm. now, but um, Father Walter Chizek, have you heard of him? I have heard oh. of Father Walter. Tell us about him. I, yeah. We haven't talked about him on the show before. Okay. It, he was a Polish American priest mm-hmm. in, in the twenties, um, snuck into Russia to try to minister to the spiritual needs of the people there. And he was um, captured and sent to five years of solitary confinement in Lubyanka, and then an additional 15 years of hard labor in the gulag. And he has a book called um, He Leadeth Me, Mm -hmm. which I would recommend everybody read. It's just some beautiful book. And he talks to stay at home moms even. I Mm -hmm. mean, his, it's just amazing how he can relate his experience in the gulag not that motherhood is like a gulag, yeah. but um, like the monotony of the day and, mm-hmm. and things like that. He's able to really speak quite beautifully on that. And so if he ever becomes a saint, I think he might be one of my favorites. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much, Nora. Thank you, Lila. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the largest religious network reaching millions of people with the truth of the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.